Good morning. You guys noticed? <laughs> Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. Tonight we're going to I have uh, speaker Michael Cocano from Arizona Origin Science Association. So if you would join me in prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, thank you for this day, for this life you've given us. Thank you for the truth of your word. I pray for your blessings this very night to be stowed upon all those who are gathered here this day. To your glory, for your honor, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out. I'm assuming this is not your typical Friday evening routine to come here, but you chose to be here, and I really appreciate it. I'm very honored that you came. I'm very thankful to Pastor Rick here for uh, not only the invitation to come, but also for your commitment to biblical authority. And that's what we're going to be doing here this, this evening. Now, um, we're just, I'm still getting a little bit of a hum up here. I've got my computer up here just because I have a few notes that I may need to refer to because otherwise it's all being run through back there. So um, we've had our prayer and we're going to get started here. And you've all heard that this little series we're doing this weekend, um, we call it True to His Word, Understanding and Defending the Biblical Account of Our Origins. And these are the five talks we're going to go through. Tonight is the Tower of Babel and Ancient Man. Tomorrow morning after the men's breakfast, and I don't know if any ladies are going to try to infiltrate that whole thing and how that works, but everyone is, yeah. everyone is welcome. Okay, that sounds good. God of wonders, God of numbers. I'm going to show how mathematics confirms the existence of God. If we did not have God, we could not have math. You say, how does that work? Well, you come back and you will find out. Then. Talk number three is continuous environmental tracking. Has anybody here familiar with the Institute for Creation Research, ICR? Okay, so many of you have, that's great. Dr. Randy Galuza has proposed a methodology for understanding biology, which they gave the term continuous environmental tracking. I'm going to give you an overview of how that works and some great examples. Still getting some hum. That's okay. Well, you keep working on it. Uh, number four, Noah and those pesky dinosaurs. Why did I call it that? Because dinosaurs have been rather difficult for creationists to explain because the evolutionary community has captured dinosaurs way, way, way back when. And from that time on, it's been like millions of years ago, dinosaurs roamed the earth. And how do we reconcile millions of years with the Bible? Well, if you want to be true to the Bible, you don't. But then how do we understand dinosaurs? Well, that's what we're going to do. Sunday morning, and then after lunch, we're going to wrap up with this talk, Road Trip, Evidence of Geological Catastrophe in the Four Corners Region. We're going to do a little, uh, it's an exploration of geology, but I do it in the form of a road trip so that if somebody should ever want to take a road trip similar to that, you have a kind of a layout to kind of get you started. So, I'm reverberating up here. Tower of Babel and Ancient Man, refuting the lie that our human ancestors were primitive. All right, and we, so I have some uh, audio and video clips, so I want to do this little test here to so make sure it's all going to be working. All right, here we go. Hey, hello in there. Hey, what's so important? What you got here that's worth living for? True love. God's word is true. God's word says that God is love. So God is the source of true love. And because he loves us, he would never lie to us. His word can be trusted. It is not obsolete. It is not irrelevant. It is not a collection of stories. It's something that we have not just the responsibility, but the privilege of being able to defend God's word in a culture that's going haywire. And is there anybody here who doesn't think the culture is going haywire? Well, that's another whole topic, okay. Um, all right, so, in, oh, now I've got two buttons to press. I'm going to go confused here. 
In God's word, he tells us where we came from and where we're going. If we choose him, we have one destiny. If we don't choose him, there's another destiny, and we don't really even want to have to go there. So our outline, uh, I'm going to go over what we're going to discuss in this talk. We have a lot of things to move through, so I'm going to try to move quickly. This will be the longest talk of the five that we're doing, but we just because we have a lot of introductory things to get through, and then there's just a lot of material to pack. But I think this is a good one to start with because we're going to put to bed the idea that man evolved from a lower life form. So we're looking. I have an introduction, some acknowledgments. We're talking about the purpose of this talk. In fact, this whole weekend. Then I'm going to take you through a little activity called examining the evidence. Then we're going to talk about what life was like in pre-flood conditions on the earth. A little review of the biblical timeline. And then we're going to talk about the Babel conflict and the Babel dispersion. Then we're going to look at evidence from anthropology, evidence from biology, and evidence from archaeology to confirm all this and put it all together. Then we'll have a little reality check and a conclusion. And along the way, I'm going to give you some resources that you might want to consider later. Speaking of resources, quickly, I have some books and some DVDs that I will make available after tomorrow evening's meeting. Uh, set up, we'll set up some tables out in the foyer there. And because that way there'll be some things that people want to, uh, you know, purchase, research um, for your own knowledge. And then, then you have resources that you can take and share with other people as well. Okay. So by way of introduction, my name is Michael. Middle name is Jerome. No relation to the city or the town. Calcano rhymes with volcano. I was born August 10, 1955 at Good Samaritan Hospital in Portland, Oregon. I had my born-again experience in January of 1981 after running into some hard knocks that I was not able to get around. And I asked God to intervene, and he did. Uh, I served for four years in the United States Navy as an electrician's mate. And then a friend of mine talked me into joining the Army National Guard, where I served for six more years. I graduated from Portland State University in December of 86 with a degree in elementary education. I taught in Oregon public schools for 17 and a half years. I moved to Pace in Arizona originally with my wife back in March of 2013, and I currently serve as the Vice President of the Gila and Navajo Divisions of the Arizona Origin Science Association. What does that mean? It means that I get the fun of being able to schedule meetings and schedule a venue and getting a speaker and putting it all together and then collecting the money and making bank deposits and going through the whole thing every, every week. And all of the officers of Arizona Origin Science Association, we serve voluntarily. And it's just it's an awesome privilege. This is a picture of my wife and myself on our first trip to Arizona. Back in 2009, we were standing on a corner in Winslow, Arizona. So you know, just something that we had to do, you know? Uh, here's a quick list of acknowledgments. I won't go through all of them, but I do want to give credit to the fact that I owe my being here tonight to the influence of a lot of people who have helped pave the way for me uh, to be able to share in this exciting ministry. Here is our logo, AZOSA, and there's our website, www.azosa.org. Uh, .com will also get you there as well. Here are the different divisions that we have. We have, uh, well, the seven, but just recently, like about two months ago, we added another eighth Santa Cruz division. So we have meetings in Lake Havasu City, Prescott, Pace and Sholo, Glendale and Mesa, Tucson, Sonoida, and Sierra Vista. And that's a very, we've had guest speakers come from out of state saying, you have this, you're this extensive all over your state. Most states have like one or maybe two in the major cities. But we try to get this word out to people who can't just always travel to Phoenix every month and to hear speakers give presentations like this. All right, there's a logo again. There's the website. And I want to make a very special acknowledgement too. The, the catalyst for tonight's meeting and also for my venture into uh, this type of ministry comes from uh, this man and his wife. This is Dr. Donald Chittick. He was a chemistry professor in the Northwest. Is anybody here familiar with Dr. Donald Chittick or his legacy? One or two hands. Okay. Well, in the Northwest, if we had a meeting like this in Oregon or Washington, probably about three quarters 
other people would raise their hand because he was a tremendous influence in that area. And he wrote a book called The Puzzle of Ancient Man, which was where a lot of the information tonight that you will get comes from. And I do have some copies of the book available. Dr. Chittick passed away a few years ago, but his wife Donna is still around, and I was able to see her on my last trip to Oregon. A delightful couple, and just been a very uh, a mentor and an inspiration to me to do this. Okay, which brings us to the purpose of this presentation is to build up your faith in the authority of the Word of God. Okay, when you leave here tonight, I want you to be more confident that God's Word is true, that God's Word can be trusted, that God's Word is relevant, that God's Word is good. Does, he, does God say what He means, and does He mean what He says? All right, and also to defend the authority of God's Word, because that is the big issue about what, we're, what we in the Arizona Origin Science Association strive to promote, is that you know, God's Word is being ridiculed as being irrelevant, outdated, you know, just a collection. The morality in here, they say, okay, the skeptics, the scoffers say, oh, you don't have to live that way. It's too restrictive. Well, I'll tell you what. The Bible says the truth will set you free. And there is great reward to being set free from, the, from God through His Word, through His Spirit, and through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, the... Um, the most significant thing that happened in world history was the crucifixion, okay? There's no question about that. That was the most important historical event on the planet Earth, but not just for the planet Earth, really for the entire created cosmos. And what did Jesus say in John 12, 32? And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. You have to fight against that if you don't want to be drawn to God. You have to put up resistance. And a lot of people have excuses for why they put up resistance. Well, we're here to demolish those ideas so that you can, when you're witnessing to somebody, you can confidently and calmly, but politely and respectfully say, there's another way to look at this, okay? So we do this by making the Bible the foundation for our thinking in every area. We start with God's Word. And whatever it says, we accept as foundational truth to everything else. And then if we hear something or see something or read something in a magazine or a museum or a national park or something like that, we can say, mm, I'm going to hold off on that. I'm going to go to God's word first. And this is where I'm going to put my confidence. Not infallible, sinful human man. There is no contradiction between true science in the Bible, and that would be in any and every area of science. Anthropology, archaeology, astronomy, biology, chemistry, geology, physics, zoology, alphabetical order. All right, so if the biblical account in Genesis is true, which we assume it is, and man did not evolve from a lower primate as he is alleged to have done, what kind of evidence should we expect to find? So in our pursuit of looking for evidence to substantiate our claim that the Bible is true and valid, and that's not only in history, but where it touches on science, it's also valid as well. So what are some things that we should find when we go out and look? Well, we should see evidence of a common language. We should see evidence of technology. Man was smart way back then, okay? Why? Because he was created perfect. We should see evidence of infrastructure in society, not the old hunting, gathering, you know, collecting wood, making grunting noises, that type of thing. With Babel, we should see an evidence of a dispersion of civilization when God confused the languages and scattered people abroad. We should also see evidence of cultural interplay and exchange as these cultures, as these people groups moved out from Babel Okay, they didn't just isolate themselves. Some did, but not all of them did. Some of them learned how to connect back to these other people groups. We should see examples of that. And then we should also see evidence of genetic commonality because we are all one family. And we should also see evidence of genetic degradation. Okay, our genes, our chromosomes, they're winding down. Okay, we're getting mutations. We're all, not to be rude, we're all mutants, okay? And we're passing mutations on to the next generation who will pass theirs on to the next generation and so on. And we have solid 
evidence of that happening. You see, there's a difference between operational science, which gives us satellites and airplanes and cell phones, because operational science is based upon what we can do in the present, okay? Scientific experiments that we can do in the present. And those are char characterized by being observable. We have to see them, okay? We can't just say, well, a long time ago, it must have happened. That is not a scientific statement. That is a philosophical statement. It has to be testable. We have to be able to set up a test to make sure that this uh, proves what we're, what we're looking after. How does water behave at sea level when we heat it? And you would say, well, it boils at 212 degrees. But at 6,000 plus feet, it boils a little bit less than that, doesn't it? And we know this because we can do this repeatedly and get the same consistent kind of results. And we have to be predictable. We have to be able to make predictions based upon the science that we're doing. This all happens in the present. That is different from historical or forensic science, where we look at something in the present and we try to come up with an explanation as to how it got there in the past. Okay? There's no way we could look at a fossil and say, well, how can I set up a test? How can I observe this fossil being formed? Because we don't have time machines. How can I uh, make a, a statement about this? Because you're, you're looking at an artifact in the present that was obviously formed in the past, but then you're coming up with a story. Well, if somebody's going to believe a story, would you b rather believe a story from a fallible, sinful human, or would you rather believe what God tells us in his word? Because this isn't stories. This is a historical document confirmed by eyewitnesses. All right, so we need to go through a little example called, a uh, little activity called examining the evidence. How does a scientist, or anybody for that matter, examine evidence? Everybody has a starting point for your thinking. Okay, uh, we could say that, oh, we're totally objective. Well, that's, that's really kind of impossible to be totally objective because we all have life experiences that we bring into any new experience that we come upon. And we have several names we could call it. We could call it bias. We could call it faith. We could call it a paradigm. We could call it a presupposition or an axiom or a worldview. I will go with bias because that is how I learned it from Dr. Donald Chittick. So, that being said, what are our bias options. There are only, believe it or not, two. Either the Bible is true or the Bible is not true. That's it. It's going to be one or the other. Either the Bible is true or the Bible is not true. Now, a person who holds the belief or the bias that the Bible is true can look at a particular body of evidence. And we all have the same evidence. Okay? We don't have creationist evidence over here and evolutionist evidence over here. The evidence is the evidence. The question is, how is it interpreted, especially in a historical context? So the person who believes that the Bible is true can look at evidence, and this could be a fossil, okay? It could be something you look at in a microscope or something you look at in a telescope, okay? Any kind of evidence. The person who believes that the Bible is true can look at that evidence and say, hmm, what I see here is evidence of a creative intelligence and a worldwide flood. At the same time, the person who believes that the Bible is not true can look at that very same evidence and say, no, what I see here are random processes operating over long periods of time. Two different people, two different starting points. The same evidence that will lead you to two different conclusions. And everyone, including scientists, have a bias for their thinking, as much as they would like to project that they don't. So the question we have to ask is, does the evidence agree with reality? Are the, conclusions, are the conclusions we reach consistent with the entire body of evidence? Excuse me for that, all right? Because either everything was created or everything created itself. And there cannot be two realities. One of these options is true, the other is fantasy. And truth is that which conforms to reality. And we all want to live in the real world. Jesus tells us in John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Speaking to the Father in prayer. And says, Jesus said this, we will put it in red as well. Now, how many of you, going back about 35 years or so, remember this? Okay, the bracelets and all stuff. And we all know this means what would Jesus do? 
I want to turn that around in 2022, and I want to put it to you this way. W-D-J-B. What did Jesus believe? What did Jesus believe about creation? Because if I'm going to think like somebody, I want to think like Jesus, okay? Mark 10, 6, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Oh, this is Jesus speaking again, so we put it in red. Genesis 1, 1 tells us, when was the beginning? It was in the beginning when God created the heaven and the earth. So what we're going to do is, I love these fancy transitions that PowerPoint gives us, we're going to put on our biblical glasses. This phrase comes from Answers in Genesis, okay? We're going to adopt the worldview that the Bible is where we start our thinking from and everything else that leads to that. Now, really quickly, uh, in mentioning Arizona Origin Science Association, I forgot to say that uh, I sent out a, an email every month announcing the meetings that we have in Sholo and also in Payson. If you want to sign up to be on my email list and you aren't already, I have a clipboard here and we'll start sending it around and we'll just send it back and over and back around that way too. So, all right, biblical glasses. So, if human evolution were true, we would expect to find that the farther we go back in history, and how do we do that? By going deeper into the rock layers, which are supposedly millions of years old, right? Then the more primitive mankind should be. The farther we dial back in history, the more primitive man, his intelligence, his, his adaptability, even his physiology should be. And furthermore, all anthropological evidence should support this assumption. All of it should, without exception. If we start going back and we start seeing evidence that contradicts the standard, you know, long, slow, gradual, upward climb, then that calls the entire theory of evolution into question. And then we can say, well, I'm sticking with this. All right, so if the biblical account of Genesis is true, and we talked about this, right, common language, evidence of non-evolution of mankind, Genetic commonalities are some of the things kind of redone here a little bit. This is a refresher. All right, so now we've got 1 Timothy 6.20 tells us, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Now, as an astute Bible scholar would say, well, that word science, that really can be translated as knowledge. This is true but it works the same way, okay? You don't want to have false knowledge because false knowledge is called a what? It's called a lie. As I'm looking at this, I'm looking at that. We're gonna get it figured out here. Before the flood, okay, so before the flood, what happened? Genesis 4, 16 tells us, then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch and he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. How many of you recognize this face? This is Ken Ham. Oh, great. You've done a good job, Pastor. These guys know who this is. This is Ken Ham. He's the president and CEO of Answers in Genesis. He says when he travels and gives talks, this is the one question that comes up most often. Well, where did Cain get his wife? He says, I talk more about Cain's wife than my own wife. <laughs> so let's answer this question. Because if this is a question that bothers a lot of people, then we need to be able to answer this question. So, Let's stop and ask ourselves some simple questions. Were there any genetic defects in Adam? No. no, because Adam was created perfect. In fact, God said it was very good. So how many genetic defects would there have been in Adam's offspring? Well, few, if any. Okay. Genesis 5.4 then goes on to tell us, the days of Adam after he became the father of Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Other sons and daughters. Oh. So originally, men would have had to marry sisters. You say, sisters? Well, in the first place, there were no other options. In the second place, who would you report it to? And in the third place, laws against close intermarriage didn't come about until 2,500 years later. In fact, if you remember, when the land of Canaan was being divided, there were these five daughters of this one guy who had no brothers, and they inherited and when they told Moses, hey, you know, if we marry somebody, then during the year of Jubilee, it will pass on. 
And so Moses commanded them to marry within their family. They married their uncle's sons, their cousins. And it wasn't a problem even then. Not something we really probably want to do today, though. So. All right, so before the flood, Genesis 4.19, Then Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of the one was Ada. The name of the second was Zillah. And Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the harp and flute. And when it says the father of, okay, that doesn't mean that he was the biological progenitor. It means uh, he was the instructor. He was the one who pioneered the field, if you would say. And as for Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain. He was the father of those, all those who play the harp and the flute. And as for Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain, instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing animal husbandry. We're seeing music. And we're seeing metallurgy. What would evolution have us to believe? Well, they would have us believe that there was hunting and gathering and grunting and the discovery of tools and fire. Well, the Bible right there contradicts what is going on. So, do we, can we find evidence of these kind of things? Hold on. Genesis 6, 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And I have a hunch that when many of us read that verse, we look at the world we live in today and we think, well, we're there again. So what did God do? Well, we know that he sent a flood to destroy the earth. And we're going to look for evidence of that, especially on Sunday afternoon's presentation. After the flood, Genesis 9.1, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Genesis 10.1, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. And the sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. Verse 9 tells us he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. So we need to take a look at that verse. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. I want you to look at this before the Lord, before the, mentioned twice in the same verse. In his book, All in the Name of the Lord, Bill Stringfellow has done some research on this phrase, before the Lord, before the Lord. And it actually translates, uh, if you look at the Hebrew, as in place of the Lord or in opposition to the Lord. Okay? And it comes from a Hebrew root word that means face. Okay? So think about that. We use a very similar terminology today. When they drop a puck on a hockey match on the center ice, that's called the what? The face-off. Uh, if two prize fighters are going to go compete with each other in the ring, we say they are going to face each other in the ring. And we also know about trash-talking people on the basketball court. They get in your face. So what is Nimrod here all about? He was a mighty hunter in God's face. It's kind of like, oh yeah? Well, hey, I'm a mighty hunter. So the name Nimrod, believe it or not, it means rebel in Hebrew. Verse 10 tells us the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Keep that in mind. He was a rebel. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, come, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So what are they doing? Whose top may reach unto heaven. Some people suggest, well, they built this so that they could escape the flood. But if you're going to build a building to escape a flood, would you put it in the plain of Shinar, or would you go to the highest mountain and build it there? There's something more to this, okay? Whose top may reach to heaven. And let us make us a name, or make a name for ourselves. Hey, you know, we're going we're gonna to make a name for ourselves. We're going to take on this public works project, and we're going to impress the rest of the world. 
lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. That was the intent. Okay? The part about a top that may reach to heaven, more and more archaeologists and anthropologists, even of a secular humanist persuasion, believe that these towers, these ziggurats, were used for astronomical observation. The religion of astronomy was born as a result of this. So, in fact, Nimrod was probably the most notorious man in the ancient world who is discredited with instigating the Great Rebellion at Babel and founding the very features of paganism, including the introduction of magic, astrology, and human sacrifice. There is, moreover, much evidence to suggest that he himself was worshipped from the very earliest times. In your face, God. One of the chief cities of Assyria was named Nimrud, and the plain of Shinar, to the early Syrians as Sinar, was itself once known as the land of Nimrod. Iraqi and Iranian Arabs speak his name with awe even today, and such is the notoriety of the man that his historical reality is quite beyond dispute. This comes to us from Bill Cooper's book, After the Flood. So, the dispersion at Babel. Genesis 11:5. But the Lord came down to see the tower, the city and the tower, which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. What is the Bible telling us here? That God is saying of these people that if they can conceive it, they can achieve it. Okay? He's saying these guys are brilliant. If they have it, if they put their mind to do something, they'll do it. Except overthrow God, right? Come, let us go down in there, confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. In his book, Map of the Ancient Sea Kings, Charles Hapgood says this, It is interesting that a tradition of a universal language seems to be common in ancient literature. In Genesis, we read, of course, and the whole earth was of one language and one speech. Lincoln Barnett, in his Treasure of Our Tongue, remarks, The notion that at one time all men spoke a single language is by no means unique to Genesis. It found expression in ancient Egypt, in early Hindu and Buddhist writings, and was seriously explored by several European philosophers during the 16th century. Charles Hapgood, Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings. So, let's go back to this. If the biblical account of Genesis is true and man did not evolve, what kind of evidence would you expect to find? Common language? Check. One down, just a few more to go. So here is a little diagram of the timeline of the lifespan of the ancient patriarchs. Okay, and they said that the laser doesn't work all that well. Oh, okay, and that's doing something. Oh, I think I might have moved us off the thing. Did I do that accidentally? Okay, I think we gotta put the little cursor back on the thing there because it's not advancing now. He knows. I think I touched that button I wasn't supposed to touch, right? Okay. The self-destruct button. Okay. Anyway, if you look at these, this timeline, it's very easy to visualize it here. I want to focus in on the right-hand side here from Noah on down. Okay. We have Shem, Arphaxad. Okay. Shem lived 600 years total. Arphaxad, his son, lived 438 years. And Shelah lived 433 years. Eber lived 464 years. Peleg lived 239 years. Okay. Let's stop at Peleg right now, but you see that there was people there. Everybody from this line, which intersects Abraham, was able to talk to Noah face to face. Everybody from this line on back was able to talk to Shem face to face. And that would have made Isaac about how old? Just before Jacob's birth. Okay? So there was a connection. These ancient people, 
I mean, even if Shem lived on a hilltop all by himself out there, people could still say, see that mountain over there? That's where the old man Shem lived. He survived the flood. He knows what it was like. Now, we get to this phrase, the earth was divided. This is important. We're going to visit it now, and then it's going to come back around, and we're going to visit it again later. Genesis 10, 21 tells us, Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, which is where we get the word Hebrew from, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born. In verse 25, it tells us, To Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Then, in verse 32 of the same chapter, it tells us, These were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations, in their nations, and from these the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. Now, many people at first glance say, oh, this is talking about the same thing. But I want to challenge you to think about some things here. In verse 25, talking about Peleg, it says the earth was divided. In verse 32, it says the nations were divided. Two different phrases being used to describe what many people believe were two different events. So let's look here. In Genesis 10.25, the word earth, as it's used in 10.25, according to the Strong's Concordance, means land, earth, earth, whole earth, earth, land, country, district, region. Whereas the word nations, as used in Genesis 10.32, means nations, people, usually of non-Hebrew people, descendants of Abraham, etc. So we're talking about two different words that seem to be talking about two very different aspects. So, in 1032, where it says the nations were divided, the word used is parad. And parad means to break off or to break in pieces or to separate by breaking. Okay? But in 1025, where it says the earth was divided, it uses paleg. And it means to divide as a channel or watercourse. This all comes from Strong's Concordance. So again, we're looking at earth and nations, and we're looking at divided, it means one thing one way, in another verse it means the other. Peleg comes from the same root word as 06388, so you jump over to 06388 and it says Peleg, and it again refers to dividing like a water course. So, the only other place that this word shows up in the Old Testament is in Job, Chapter 38, verse 25. Who hath divided a channel for the overflowing water or a path for the thunderbolt? It's talking about dividing, okay? To divide as a channel or water course. So where does this take us? How about if we just, for the sake of trying to understand this better, we substitute the word surveyed, okay? If you're going to dig a ditch, you have to know where you want to dig the ditch, okay? When God says he creates a path for the lightning, He's like, since God knows everything anyway, he knows when a lightning bolt starts, he knows exactly where it's going to go through the atmosphere and exactly where it's going to strike the ground. Okay? I'm offering you this to think about because we're going to come back later and look at some evidence that really tries to tie this together. So, scattering them abroad. And what do we have? Scatter, this, this verse is translated. Scatter, scatter abroad. Disperse, cast abroad, dry, break to pieces, shake to pieces. Very different. And for my own reference, I use uh, Blue Letter Bible, blue, uh, at blueletterbible.org. Uh, that's my handy online one, and just uh, you can use any one you want to, but uh, you get pretty much the same results. All right, so I said we would look at evidence from anthropology. Now, we're going to take ourselves and we're going to try to put ourselves in the mindset of these uh, Tower of Babel type people, okay? So we're going to look at the dispersion of Babel. So in Babel Central, okay, we have a high culture. We know this because what did God say? Now this is what they begin to do. Now there's nothing could be withheld from them. Okay? So they had a very high culture going on. They had this infrastructure. They're building this big tower, this big public works thing. And then the people were dispersed. Okay, so, and they're moving out, okay, because it's like they're sensing this is going to be kind of a hostile place. Maybe we don't want to stay here. So they're spreading out. Now, when they spread out, they can't take everything with them. So they're going to experience a culture loss. Have any 
anybody in here ever experienced a purposely voluntary culture loss in their life? Let me rephrase it. Has anybody here ever gone camping? <laughs> OK. When you go camping, I mean, there are some people who I see these big things going down the highway. They look like they're taking everything with them. But most of us, when we go camping, we take a limited amount of things with us, OK? And you know, we're only going to be able to burn so much wood you know, and cook so many meals and stuff like this, OK? We have to pack water and stuff like that. You are experiencing a culture loss. Now, what if these people back in Babel said, you know what? Hey, we're still ambitious. We still want to do stuff here. We didn't leave. We chose to stay. Uh, but we, we, we lost our labor force. So what are they going to do? They're going to go out and they're going to try to subjugate and bring people back forcefully and force them to be part of their labor pool, right? Because they're aggressive, they're assertive, they're also bright. So they're going to go out. So to avoid being captured and enslaved, what would you have to do? You'd have to move yourself farther out into the frontier and experience an aboriginal or primitive culture. Now let's stop for a minute and just put ourselves in the situation. Suppose you're camping, OK, out in the woods somewhere, and some guys show up in a pickup truck with guns, OK, and they basically say, hey, folks, we're here to take your car, and we're going to take your clothes, we're going to take your money, we're going to take your phones. And they leave you with just a little bit of necessities, a whole lot less than you arrived with. Are you any less intelligent than you were the day you arrived? You might think so, because you allowed yourself to get robbed. But, but you haven't suddenly become ignorant. You haven't suddenly become you know, primitive. Now you've been stripped of all of your support system. You've been stripped of your infrastructure. And you may have to spend a night or two maybe sleeping in a cave, maybe even living in a cave temporarily until help arrives or whatever. Okay. Now I know this is a little bit of a scenario, okay, but you understand what's going on in this context. Okay. When they discover that there were people a long time ago who lived in caves, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were stupid cave-dwelling people. In fact, in the town of Cooper PD, uh, Australia, anybody heard of Cooper PD, Australia? A few people. Cooper PD, Australia, uh, their official slogan on their official website is get out back, get underground. Okay? Uh, there's a website that describes uh, Cooper PD, and in fact, in fact, if you wanted to visit Cooper PD and you wanted to stay at the Comfort Inn, the Comfort Inn, well, here's a, here's a picture of an underground house with all kinds of stuff in it. But you can stay at the Comfort Inn for only $171 Australian a night. And the entire hotel has been carved underground. Why? Well, because Cooper PD is out in the uh, outback. And it gets very hot above ground. But underground, it's nice and cool. OK. Are the people that live in Cooper PD savages? No. They're they're, it's a mining town. OK. Uh, but they have all the comforts of home living in these caves. So just because somebody lives in a cave doesn't make them a caveman. You've heard the expression, just the, the sleeping in the garage doesn't make you a car. Okay, Same idea here. So let's look at some of these examples that we have been trying to sell on the idea that, uh, well, this is proof that man has evolved. Okay, let's, let's just knock those out of the park right now. Java Man, discovered in 19, or 1891, was found to be a human leg bone and a monkey skull cap. It was a hybrid. Somebody had put it together and tried to pass it off as an ancient uh, ancestor of man. Homo erectus, the term was coined in 1894. Turns out later, upon closer examination, it was completely modern human. Then we have Neanderthal Man from 1856. It was examined later and discovered by somebody who knew their anatomy to be a very old skeleton suffering from arthritis in rickets. He wasn't on the way up. He was on the way down. <laughs> and furthermore, it's been said that if you were to take Neanderthal man and shave him and put him in modern clothes and put him on any street in any town in Europe, nobody would even notice him, would, would pass as a European male. And did you know this? This is cool. Neanderthal man knew how to make, are you ready? Wait for it. Wait for it. Neanderthal man knew how to make super glue. Super glue. Archaeologists analyzing stone tool artifacts have discovered that Neanderthals fixed wooden handles to flint knives, not with lashing it with leather, 
but by means of superglue made from birch pitch. Say that three times in a row. The smoldering process to turn birch bark into usable glue only works at a temperature of 340 degrees to 400 degrees Celsius and under exclusion of oxygen. Lower temperatures prohibit resin in the wood from melting and higher temperatures would burn tar excluded from the birch pitch. And to convert that to Fahrenheit, it's 644 to 752 degrees. They have to cure this birch pitch in an oxygen-less atmosphere for a while to create the superglue. Oh, but he was just a dummy. Not. Okay. Continuing on. Piltdown Man, found in 1912, found to be a hoax after standing for 40 years when they realized this guy took different parts from an orangutan and a human and put them together. Nebraska Man, 1922, was used as evidence in the Scopes trial. The only artifact found was one tooth, and that tooth was later discovered to be from a peccary. Why, we here in Arizona know a little bit of a thing or two about peccaries, don't we? In Arizona, we have collared peccaries. He shouldn't have been named Nebraska Man. He should have been named Havelina Man because that's where the tooth came from. But all this was built up. Oh, we found this tooth. This, this proves it. And they used that during the Scopes trial, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And Lucy, Australopithecus atherensis, discovered in 1973, simply now classified as a large extinct chimp. <laughs> How about this one? I think Gary Larson from the far side has more insight than some of us uh, have given him credit for. Primitive spelling bees. Cave, C-A-V-E, cave. The next guy says, oh, sure, I'll probably get Australopithecus. <laughs> yeah. All right, but what about uh, getting back to our list? Cro-Magnon Man. Cro-Magnon Man, we know, drew cave paintings. Cro-Magnon Man is also depicted as clean-shaven wearing shoes, pants, coats, and even hats. No shaggy-haired animal skin covered savages here. Instead, we have sewn clothes tailored with collars and sleeves. Pan oh, see. In fact, real jewelry begins at this time. Numerous bone needles have been found with tiny eyes as well as obsidian razors. The guy was a clean-shaven guy, okay? cro magnon man also drew pictures of his cro magnon woman. Would you like to see how cro magnon man depicted his woman? Please, somebody say that you would like to see <laughs> how cro magnon man depicted his woman. All right. In your mind, you're, all, you're looking at this canvas, and you're thinking, okay. okay. In three, two, one. That is a picture of a cro magnon man's woman. One of the few upper Paleolithic drawings of a human being. Notice the relatively modern looking tailored clothing with sewn arms and legs, also shoes and a hat. Cro Magnon men are sometimes depicted as clean shaven and even playing musical instruments. These are civilized people who became refugees in a new land with no infrastructure. Not who we were led to believe, but maybe back to Gary Larson. Early checkers. Oh, wait, I don't want to do that. And there's only two squares. <laughs> Early plumbers. Oh, this not be cheap. How about before there was paper and scissors? Dang, tight again. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> Available from Answers in Genesis. Three ways to make an ape man by Dr. David Minton, who recently passed away as well. Uh, Dr. David Minton, all of his work, all of his, his, anything that he's published or his videos are all top quality. You should uh, definitely want to get a hold of him. He has one called The Seeing Eye and the Hearing Ear, which is great. He has one on Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. He was an anatomy professor at Washington School of Medicine in St. Louis. He also had a series that he did some time ago with two middle school age students called Body of Evidence, and he goes to these videos uh, talk about different body systems. And when my wife and I, who is a nurse, okay, and I took a year of anatomy and physiology in college, we're watching this, we're going like, I didn't learn that when I was going to school. I didn't, it's like, wow, this is great stuff, you know? And it's all done from a wonderfully biblical perspective. All right, I mentioned the Scopes trial a little bit ago. Well, wasn't it, didn't that solve the whole question? I mean, that's, that's what the evolutionists want us to believe. Well, the Scopes trial, that settled that whole creation evolution argument. No, it did not. 
The state of Tennessee passed the Butler Act in March 1925, which prohibited teaching that humans evolved from a lower primate. A guy by the name of, hello? Did we get off the little thing up there again? It doesn't, it's not one to four. Let's, we'll see, if I back it up, will it that work? Nope, it's not going backwards or forwards. Call in tech support. <laughs> How are we all already? Let's try it again. And... Okay, there we go. All right, we're good. John T. Scopes was a coach who substituted for the high school biology teacher during the last few weeks of the school year. Scopes could not state specifically that he had actually taught evolution to his students, but he agreed to admit that he did so that the ACLU could bring a suit to challenge the Butler Act in the state of Tennessee. Essentially, every piece, every piece, not just Nebraska man, but every piece of scientific evidence presented as proof of evolution has since been discredited even by the evolutionists. Scopes was found guilty and fined $100, of which he was paid, which was paid by the ACLU. He never served any time for the offense. The movie Inherit the Wind shows outraged townspeople and locking in jails. No, none of that ever happened. The ruling was later overturned even on a technicality, and the movie Inherit the Wind makes many distortions from the actual facts of the trial. So, evidence of non-evolution of mankind? Check, check. All right. Uh, one more little cute thing here about evolution. The real reason evolution started. <laughs> I don't believe that. I don't expect you to believe it either, but I mean, somebody was clever enough to think of that, all right? A friend of mine shared this poem with me some time ago. I'm going to share it with you quickly. Three monkeys sat in a coconut tree discussing things as they are said to be, said one to the others. Now listen, you two, there's a certain rumor that can't be true that man descended from our noble race, the very idea is a great disgrace. No monkey has ever deserted his wife, starved her babies and ruined her life, and you've never known a mother monk to leave her babies with others to bunk or pass them on from one to another till they scarcely know who is their mother. And another thing you'll never see, a monk build a fence around a coconut tree and let the coconuts go to waste, forbidding all other monks to taste. Why, if I put a fence around this tree, starvation would force you to steal from me. Here's another thing a monkey won't do. Go out at night and get in a stew, or use a gun or a club or a knife to take some other monkey's life. Yes, man descended, the ornery cuss, but brother, he didn't descend from us. <laughs> Evidence from biology. Here's a picture. And I'm going to ask the question, how many races of mankind are there? Multiple choice question. Is it A, 1, B, 3, C, 8, D, more than 17? You... Well, that's kind of loud. Okay, we'll skip that. Right. How many of you think one? How many of you think, Pastor, you're doing a good job. How many of you think three? Three sons of Noah? Okay, how many of you think maybe eight from the eight people on board the ark? How many of you think there maybe is more than 17? All right. Now, what did I say earlier about making the Bible a foundation for a thinking area? No problem. We're going to do that. Before we do, I just want to really kind of quickly make mention of the book, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. There is also a second or secondary title that goes to that from the original book, by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Darwin had very racist views on those that he viewed as less evolved than his contemporary Europeans. If a biology teacher in any high school or college today were to teach his racial views that were presented in this book, they would find themselves in some serious, serious trouble. What were Darwin's views on races? At some future period, not very dis distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. At the same time, the anthropomorphous apes will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will intervene between man and a more civilized state, as we may hope. Even then, the Caucasian and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of now between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. Darwin is trying to equate these differences and these similarities. Okay. 
He's saying here that the Negro is not much more than a, a, an aborigine or a gorilla. But we, right, we're going to put on our biblical glasses. So we're going to go now to God's word and see what it says. And in Acts 17, 26, it tells us, And he hath made of one blood all nations of mankind, all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitations. He, he knew a long time ago that we'd all be here in Sholo this evening. So we go back to the question, how many races of mankind are there? One, that's what most of you answered, so most of you are going to get a passing score tonight. That's very good. Okay. Why? Because you have studied up, obviously, because of this man here. And in fact, another interesting thing to note, more and more scientists are asserting that the term race is meaningless and should be discarded. In fact, I found a couple of websites. The National Association for the Practice of Anthropology says on their website, that the idea of race should be discarded. And uh, the idea of race, a book by Robert Bernasconi, says the same thing. The Journal of American Academy of Dermatology, right, skin color. Yes, let's abandon race. It does not accurately correlate with hair form. And how about this one? The National Center for Biotechnology Information. We should abandon race as a biological category in biomedical research, okay? Even secular-minded people are saying this whole thing about race is irrelevant because when now with genetics and the study of genetics, we're looking at DNA, mankind is more closely related. The, the majority of our genome that we share, like 98% of our genome is identical. It's only little tiny differences that distinguish people groups from other people groups. And that's why we have this in the biblical view. We have Adam and Eve. They had sons and daughters. It bottlenecked at Noah and his sons. And then at the Tower of Babel, they dispersed. And so you have different people groups, okay, but not different races because we all came from the same father. And Eve was called Eve because she was the what? Mother of all the living. All right? So really quickly, let's take you through a 90-second lesson in genetics. This is a very, very quick, watered-down version, okay? We know that we inherit genes from our parents. Not these kind. <laughs> these kind, right? So let's just say, for illustration, okay, that there are two main genes for skin color, A and B. And then you have big A, which is dominant, and little a, which is recessive, and big B, which is dominant, and little b, which is recessive. Okay? By mixing them up, you could effectively get at least, in a little Punnett square here, 16 different shades of skin color. Now, in reality, Modern genetics has determined that there are at least 15 different genes that all interact to create your skin color, whether you're fair or less fair. So if you have strong um, dominant genes, A and Bs, you'd have darker skin. If you have recessive genes, you'd have fair skin, red hair, the whole thing, all right? An actual case study. Remy Horder and Kylie Hogson were British uh, subjects, okay? And they're both half Jamaican and half British. And mom one day was discovered to be pregnant with twins. And when the twins were born, born a minute apart, two sisters who strangers can't believe came from the same mom, right? So you know that they're British. And here they were as little girls. And here they are as a little bit older girls. Their names are Kean and Remy Hodson. And here's what an article about them said. But despite their differences, the twins have an incredibly close bond. Their proud mum says they've never questioned their different skin color. They know they are twins, but they never ask why they don't look the same. They were born this way, and they've always accepted it. They, they are such perfect example of how it should be. They are not bothered about their skin color and how different they look to each other. It isn't important to them. It's about what they are like underneath. They are the best of friends. And don't we wish that everybody could understand this? Well, they're not the only one. There's also another example here. Lucy and Marie Aylmer, also twins, born, I think, five minutes apart. In fact, very interesting, they were interviewed for Inside Edition. I'm going to play that video clip for you. There's one thing, though, I want to kind of clarify first. The, the commentator is going to use the terms black and white, OK? Black and white, that's, that's, that's really kind of mis it's a, it's a misnomer, 
okay? Black is like this, okay? White is like this. If I ever look white like this, you've already too late to call 911, all right? <laughs> okay, just to make sure you understand that. So we're gonna just kind of go around past that, okay? But there they are, a little bit older. And then they grew up to be teenagers. And here's the inside edition. Play. These pretty teens are best friends, and they're also something else, something that may surprise you. We're twins. Believe it or not, they're twins. Yep, we're twins, the we're same twin mom, sisters. <laughs> same dad. You heard right, they have the same mom and dad. What are the odds that one would be black and one white? A lot of people are just in shock. Lucy and Maria Aylmer live in Gloucester, England. Maria has a caramel complexion, brown eyes, and thick curly black hair. Lucy has pale white skin, ginger red hair, blue eyes, and freckles. Most people have the same reaction when they hear they are twins. They, they say, um, how did it happen? We don't believe you. So how did it happen? Their mom, Donna, is half black and half white. The twins' dad, Vince, is white. The couple was thrilled when a sonogram revealed they were expecting twins. I just cried. <laughs> I was, it was shock. Mom did a double take when she delivered one black and one white baby. I'm so glad Mom dressed us in such cute little outfits. Mom dressed her adorable twin daughters in matching outfits, just like twins everywhere. But by age 10, Lucy says she didn't feel like a twin, so why dress like one? We don't look alike, so why should we have to wear the exact same thing? Maria says she once wished for Lucy's straight hair. I used to cry about it. I hate my curly hair. And Lucy says she was sometimes taunted at school. They thought I was adopted. You call me a ghost. <laughs> now 18, the twins not only look different, <laughs> they have very different personalities. We're completely, completely different. different. Maria loves getting dressed up in chic clothing. She is very outgoing. Never, I love meeting people. Like I'm not scared to approach people or anything. So whereas I am, I'm terrified of like going up to random strangers. Lucy prefers casual clothes, but they've come to embrace their uniqueness as black and white twins. If I have kids one day, they might come out looking like Lucy. She could have twins, or she could have twins someday that might actually come out looking like her sister Lucy. Uh, there are other examples. Well, even National Geographic did this. These twin sisters make us rethink everything we know or thought we knew about race. Okay. This is Dr. Robert Carter. He's with Creation Ministries International. I've had the pleasure of meeting him a couple times. He had a video that he produced uh, through Creation Ministry International called Mitochondrial Eve and the Three Daughters of Noah. He is a geneticist by training, and uh, he has some really interesting... He says that the field of genetics is becoming the field of the data processor because the information is coming in so quickly, and there's so much information that we're learning about the human genome as well. If people, if people really believed God's word, racism would disappear overnight, okay? It's because people want to believe a lie about how we got here that they get all these misperceptions and then you get these weird people like being ornery with each other. It's like, it, it doesn't make any sense. But then again, not following God doesn't make sense, okay? The best outline for how to live your life is found right here. Uh, there's a video called Only One Race, available uh, from Answers in Genesis. Also this one here, One Race, Run One Blood, One Race, from a series called Foundations that Ken Ham video. In fact, there's a whole series, available again from AnswersInGenesis.org. After one of his conferences, somebody came up to Ken Ham and said, you know, I've got a problem with that song that we sing in the Cradle World Division. Jesus loved the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. He says, she said, that to me just seems very divisive. She says, and he says, well, yeah, it does. And she says, but I have what I think might be a solution. He says, okay, what is it? And she told him, and he says, I like that. Let's, let's go with that. Instead of this, how about... Jesus loved the little children, all the children of the world, shades of brown from dark to light, all are precious in his sight. 
Because you know what? We all have our skin color is actually a shade of created by the pigment melanin. There are some people like myself who don't have a whole lot. There are some who have a whole lot more, okay? But it's all about more or less melanin, which is a pigment. And, you know, it's like, okay, so again, it points us back to what? The biblical account that we are all related. We are all one family. And if Noah, I mean, if, if Adam and Eve were given this broad genetic mix, then they could effectively have had offspring that, you know, this one comes out, this coat, and this one, this one, and this one, and they're all different shades and colors and eyebrows, eyelids. Uh, let me back up here a second. Um, this is Dr. Nathaniel Jeanson. He is also a geneticist. He went to uh, some little Bible college back east. Harvard was the name of it, yeah. <laughs> he is, like I say, by all accounts, he's brilliant. He works for Answers in Genesis. He wrote a book a while back called Traced, or called Replacing Darwinism, Replacing Darwin, The New Origin of Species. And he just came out recently with another one, which I'm in the process of reading. It's a little bit tougher sledding. It's called Traced, Human DNA's Big Surprise. And he says, about this book, he says, creationists now have enough information about genetics that we can take that and go on offense. Now, he doesn't mean being offensive, but he means we don't have to wait for the evolutionists to bring the argument to us. We can take it to them and say, this is unexplainable by evolutionary terms. And he can, he's mapped out how the human family is all related. His book actually, uh, he's talking about haplogroups and this and that and, and the A1B1C type of thing and, and uh, stuff. And, uh, but he, he writes in such a way as like it's, it's fairly digestible, okay? It takes a little while to get through. So another resource that I would like to recommend. While we're on the subject here, I just want to briefly mention critical race theory. What Marxism was unable to accomplish through division by class, CRT seeks to accomplish by dividing people by race, thereby undoing what the Civil Rights Movement and Dr. Lark, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. sought when he said he looked forward to a day when people will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Just throwing that in, we're not going to get too political here because we're going to move right on next to what is genetic entropy? Okay? It is the genetic degradation of living things. Genetic entropy is the systematic breakdown of the internal biological information systems. Say that three times in a row. Internal biological information systems that make life alive. Genetic entropy results from genetic mutations, which are typographical errors in the programming of life. Life's instruction manuals, your DNA and your DNA and yours and yours and yours and all of ours. Mutations systematically erode the information that encodes life's many essential functions. Biological information consists of a large set of specifications and random mutations systematically scramble, not improve, these specifications, gradually but relentlessly destroying the programming instructions essential to life. I know I'm quick video here. There's a problem, and it doesn't matter if you're looking at the human genome or the chimpanzee genome or any other genome. And the problem is that the information is degrading and mutations are building up in populations over time. So I've been studying genetic entropy for the last 13 years, and it's a really profound problem, and it's something widely acknowledged by geneticists, and it is the problem that bad mutations accumulate in the human genome. And this is best illustrated by just considering it on a personal level. In your body or in my body, we have about three new mutations every time a cell divides. So this is um, sobering because it's the reason we die. And so the reason that uh, we get old and all of our systems start to break down is because of this mutational process and the accumulation of bad mutations in our genome. It's why there's an upper lifespan. Now, the problem is bigger still. Because, of course, we already know that we're mortal. But we transmit a certain fraction of our mutations to our children. And they add more mutations to it, and then they pass it on to their children. And then they add more mutations still, and they add it to the next generation. So this is a problem not just for people, but for the whole human race. And logically, the human race should be devolving, not evolving. 
basically the human race is degenerating, the human genome is rusting out like a car. That's Dr. John Sanford from Cornell University. He was the inventor of the gene gun, which was used when splicing DNA of different plants is what he did his work with. So, so evidence of genetic commonality and degradation, check. All right, we're going to move to cultural interplay and exchange. All right, so we're going to look at evidence from archaeology. Most people here recognize these great pyramids of Giza. We're looking at architecture, first of all. These um, pyramids are perfectly and precisely aligned to the cardinal points, north, south, east, west. The base of the Great Pyramid is 13 square acres, and at the base, the variance across the entire thing is less than an eighth of an inch. Now, if you were to go find a contractor and say, I want you to level me a field and pave it so that the variance is less than an eighth of an inch anywhere, they would say, keep your money, I can't do it. Okay, but yet, the builders of the pyramids could. And the oldest pyramids are the most sophisticated. Hmm, well, how did that turn out? We also, remember we talked about ziggurats before as being observatories for astronomical events? They, these, this pyramid-shaped structure shows up all over the world, like in Chichen Itza. We took a tour down in Mexico one time, and, and our tour guide says, sometimes they call it chicken pizza, but <laughs> it's just one, one, one more way to remember it. Then we have Machu Picchu building this entire city up at this high elevation. And then in a place called Palenque, Mexico, we have this structure. Okay. Now, in his book, Mysteries of Creation, Dennis Peterson, visited this site, and this is what he says about it. He says, when I was there on a sweltering April day, the temperature was about 100 degrees and the humidity was 100%. But inside this immense six-story high structure, the rooms were air-conditioned. Carefully engineered corridors channeled cool air through massive stone passageways, assuring ideal temperatures year-round. This ancient system has been working perfectly for a thousand years, even with no one there to maintain it. They knew how to design a building based on the topography of the landscape so that air passing through would create cool terms. But we read about, you know, groundhogs and critters that live underground with their burrows and they, it's air conditioned and they, and they even have a little place where they put their waste and the, and the scent all goes out. It's like smart little critters. It wasn't just man. Then there's a place called Sacsayhuaman down in Peru the site was pilfered until the year 1934, and only about 10% of it remains, but it's very interesting. These stones that you see everywhere are not indigenous to that site. The closest location is from a mountain 20 miles away. Stones are fitted together, some with 10, 12, and even 36 sides. No mortar or cement was used, and yet it still stands. See this picture here with these seven people? standing in front of that one block, that large stone is estimated to weigh a hundred tons. In his book, Secrets of the Lost Races, Rene Norbergen says this, what is truly, oh, hang on a second here, what is truly impossible about the block is that it is the size of a five-story house and weighs an estimated, are you ready, 20,000 tons. We have no combination of machinery today that could dislodge such a weight, let alone move it any distance. The fact that the builders of Sakshuaman could and did move this block shows their mastery of a technology which we as yet have not attained. Now, after I came across this, I said, well, what is the biggest crane that we have? What would be the biggest thing we could possibly use? So I went and I found the world's largest mobile crane. It is owned by this company in the Netherlands. I won't try to dare pronounce it. This mobile crane has a total maximum lift capacity of only 1,600, not 20,000. And when we say it's portable, okay, mobile, it's not like on wheels where you just get in and drive it up to the work site. It has to be disassembled and reassembled on site, but it can be. Still a lot of work. And this thing can only lift a fraction of what the builders of Sakshwaman were able to quarry and partially move a stone. 
in Tiahuanaco near La Paz in Bolivia. It's, the town sits at an elevation of 13,300 feet. That'd be like, a, that'd be like up on uh, San Francisco Peaks skiing. This is a uh, stone entrance called the Puerta del Sol, Gateway to the Sun. There are some interesting facts about Tiahuanaco. The atmospheric pressure at this elevation is only eight pounds per square inch instead of 13, like we're used to. Many non-acclimated persons experience nausea from being at that elevation, but even more interesting is the fact that seeds will not sprout, so crops cannot be grown locally, so the people who live there had to have their crops imported. But when they began to do some serious excavation of Tiwanaku, they found something quite interesting. When they took part of a wall apart, they found that the bricks were held together by metal staples. You say staples. Staples, not in the staple gun type, but they would chisel out a channel between the two with wider ends, and then they needed a portable smelting device to heat metal to pour into this so it could harden and hold the bricks together. Portable smelters, long time ago in Tiwanaku, they're not knuckle draggers. Well, let's look at some similarities between Egypt and the Americas. Both Egypt and the Americas have huge pyramids and, again, aligned to the cardinal points. Egypt and America both have temples with megalithic stones. Egypt and America, these uh, similarities, extremely fine joints of less than 1 50th of an inch. You can't pass a, a, a sewing needle between these cracks. Both Egypt and the Americas used royal headdresses of similar style. Both employed a unique style of construction using L-shaped corners. Both of them used clamps. The Egyptian ones look a little different, but it's the same idea, to hold stones in place. And they both used the process of mummification to preserve and honor their dead. Just really quickly talking about Egypt. Egyptian blue in the Egyptian art. It was uh, not that long ago that they discovered what made this paint. It was a pigment. It was copper, calcium copper tetrasilicate. And the chemical formula is that. It had to be mixed together in very precise proportions, then heated to 1,650 degrees Fahrenheit for several hours to get the chemical to a bond properly. And it does not fade even under extreme sunlight. So the ancient Egyptians knew how to make paint that could last for thousands of years. Talk about rhino shield, right? OK. And that's what it looks like under a microscope. If you want another supplemental resource, this book, The Genius of Ancient Man, I believe I still have one copy of that, which I can make available tomorrow night. But I also do know that I do have several copies of this book, The Puzzle of Ancient Man, by Dr. Donald Chittick. OK. so. Moving next, do we see evidence of cultural interplay and exchange? Check. The strong parallel suggests that both cultures were influenced by a common technology thousands of years before Columbus. Could ancient man have achieved transoceanic travel? Going back to Peleg, who has surveyed? Okay. Could ancient man have been traveling the globe before Columbus, before Magellan, before the Vikings? This, if you're not aware, is called the Piri Reis map. It was drawn on gazelle skin in the year 1513 and discovered in Constantinople in the year 1924. Admiral Reis stated on this map that this map was copied from older source maps dating back to the time of Alexander the Great. You say, OK, we got a map. It's kind of old. Well, here's where it gets really interesting, folks. The PB Reis map shows the western coast of Africa, the eastern coast of South America, and the northern coast of Antarctica. The northern coastline of Antarctica is perfectly detailed. The most puzzling, however, is not so much how PB Reis managed to draw such an accurate map of the Antarctic region 300 years before it was discovered or rediscovered, but that the map shows the coastline under the ice. So in other words, he was able to get this map was drawn before Antarctica had ice built up. Now to understand that, you need to understand, well, when was this ice age? When did the ice age happen? That would have happened during the uh, several centuries after Noah's flood. And that's another whole talk that could be done on some other time. 
1953, a Turkish naval officer sent the Pee Wee Reyes map to the U.S. Navy Hydrographic Bureau. To evaluate it, M.I. Walters, the chief engineer of the Bureau, called for help Arlington H. Mallory, an authority on ancient maps who had previously worked with him. After a long study, Mallory discovered the projection method used. To check out the accuracy of the map, he made a grid and transferred the PB race map onto a globe. The map was totally accurate. He stated that the only way to draw a map of such accuracy was by aerial surveying, but who, 6,000 years ago, could have used airplanes to map the Earth? Okay, we'll forgive him for the 6,000 because, again, this is coming from a secular standpoint. The hydrographic office couldn't believe what they saw. They were even able to correct some errors in present day maps. Are you kidding me? The precision on determining the longitudinal coordinates, on the other hand, shows that to draw the map, it was necessary to use the spheroid trigonometry, a process supposedly not known until the middle of the 18th century. Habgood proved that the PV radius map is plotted out in plane geometry containing latitudes and longitudes at right angles in a traditional grid, yet it is obviously copied from an earlier map that was projected using spherical trigonometry. Not only did the early map makers know that the Earth was round, but they also had knowledge of its true circumference to within 50 miles. Well, that does throw a kink in the evolutionist plans, doesn't it? This is the Orontius Phineas map from a little bit. It's, it's a wood carving showing Antarctica with a unfrozen, unglaciated coastline. The Earth was divided. Who has surveyed a channel? Okay. Now, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. Okay. I'm drawing my information from books that I read from other people who are scholars. But when you take the sum total of the evidence, we're looking at something here and say, how did these ancient people know so much about the Earth? To a radius of 50 miles? Circumference of 50 miles, excuse me. And that again, there's another book again, Maps of the Ancient Sea, Keys, sea Kings, available from Amazon. So, global travel and dispersion, check. One more to go, evidence of technology. For that, we're going to look at something called out-of-place artifacts, also known by the nickname of oop arts, out-of-place artifacts. Okay, this is what's called an Olmec head. Okay, it's found in South America, but who does it look like? Found in Central America and Eastern Mexico, carved from basalt, they're believed by the best dating methods they can come up with to be about 4,000 years old. That would put it right about uh, post-flood. This particular one in Santiago Tuxla in Veracruz, Mexico, in his book, uh, Fingerprints of the Gods, Graham Hancock writes this. Uh, wait a minute, I hit the wrong button. Uh, okay, here we go. Here then was the first mystery of the Olmecs, a monumental piece of sculpture more than 2,000 years old, which portrayed a subject with unmistakable Negroid features. There were, of course, no African blacks, black, okay, in the New World 2,000 years ago, nor did any arrive until the slave trade began well after the conquest. Well, that's traditional thinking. But there is, however, firm paleoanthropological evidence that one of the many different migrations into the Americas during the last Ice Age did consist of people of Negroid stock. So you have some people from Africa migrating to Central and South America that long time ago. These are known as Las Bolas Grandes. I'll let you do your own Spanish translation of that. There are over 186 of them still found all over Costa Rica. They are spherical, and the variance of these is only about plus or minus 0.2% from being perfectly round. How do they know how to carve big basalt balls in that, to that kind of accuracy? We have all heard about the Mayan calendar. Our Gregorian calendar calculates the exact length of a year at 365.2425 days. But the actual length is 365.2422. This ancient Mayan calendar has the length at 365.2420 and is therefore more accurate, but it was only not so long ago that they discovered the secret was that it was computed using base 20. We use base 10. 
using base 20 adds levels of complication to that that I don't want to even try to go into. That'll freak somebody out someday. <laughs> you think they did it on purpose for us, you know? This may not look like much, but this was actually found to be an ancient battery from a 2,000-year-old village near Baghdad. And that's what it's composed of, asphalt, copper tube, iron rod, more asphalt at the bottom. Reproductions using copper iron cores and grape juice for electrolyte have been successfully used to electroplate metals. Electroplating 2,000 years ago? Who would have guessed? This is an ancient hammer found in London, Texas in June of 1934 in a rock layer supposedly 500 million years old. When they examined the metal, they found it to be composed of 96.6% iron, 2.6% chlorine, and 0.74% sulfur, which is a very exotic blend, very hard to achieve. But remember about Tubal Cain? He was an artificer of bronze and iron way back when. Then there's this interesting thing right here. Doesn't look like much, folks, but it's called the Antikythera mechanism. In 1901, a Greek sponge diver, Elias Stadiados, discovered a ship that was determined to have been sunk about 100 BC. One recovered artifact was a wooden box with a mass of corroded bronze. When the device was x-rayed years later, it was shown to be an elaborate analog computer. Analog, like analog watch. And it talks about the sun gear having this many teeth that measures with this other gear, measures with this other gear, blah, 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 blah. And you come up with this approximation of the astronomical ratio. They built replicas of it. And it not only could it compute the movements of the sun and moon, but many experts believe it was capable of tracking several major planets as well. Well, if you're going to be out navigating at sea, you've got to have a device to help you navigate because at night you're going to be using stars. And we didn't have GPS back then. But, you know, if they could have achieved it, they could have probably put a satellite up. Who knows? I found some of these interesting things in a very unusual place in a Time Life book. It's a coffee table book by Time Life. It's called Feats and Wisdom of the Ancients. I bought mine through abebooks.com at the time, which is, is like all the book houses in the world can put their inventory on this. So you can buy it from Great Britain, or you can buy it from Belize, or some other place where they have English. Um, and uh, it's very interesting because they, they just they show all these anomalies. They don't come up with a, they don't suggest, well, maybe this means God or maybe it means aliens. They just say, hmm, isn't this interesting? And they kind of leave you with, to draw your own conclusion. All right, evidence of technology. Bingo, we've got them all checked off. So, reality check. If evolution were true, then the human race evolved up from an ape like ancestor. We've Kick that one out. Mankind is progressively becoming more advanced. Well, how can that be if we lost the technology to do what some of these people have done? If evolution were true, then the biblical account of history is therefore wrong. And if the biblical account of history is wrong, then mankind therefore has no need of a savior because, hey, we're doing pretty good on our own, aren't we? But also, there should be no evidence to the contrary for this hypothesis. Well, that's an interesting concept, but based on the evidence presented tonight here, does it agree with reality? I submit to you a resounding no, it does not. The Bible still stands. The Bible still rings true. But one more from Gary Larson. Well, I suppose it'll be a few thousand years before we get an arts and leisure section. If the Bible is true, mankind was made perfect in God's image, and we are all related. If the Bible is true, then mankind inherited a sinful nature as a result of Adam's fall, which we all have. If the Bible is true, the ancient world was deluged by a global flood because of man's wickedness. If the Bible is true, then standard evolutionary theory is wrong as mankind is becoming more corrupt, including our genetics. But the good news, people, is if the Bible is true, which we all believe it is, I hope we all believe it is, we have hope for the future. Jesus is coming soon to grant eternal life to all those who love him. 
if Adam is in your past, okay, then absolutes come from God and God sets the rules. But if an ape is in your past, well, then, you know, morality is relative and you can set the rules yourself. Which side are you going to be on? Not only that, folks, but this is about taking this message of hope that we have to other people who are skeptics, who have only been able to digest one side, okay? We have a way of bringing evidence to them to help them. And we can help them break through some of those misconceptions that they may have been taught by the museums and the natural history museums and the national parks and so on and so on. So what do we do? What does all this mean for us? First Peter 3.15 tells us, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. That's the first thing we do. And then what is it? Then we are to always be prepared to give an answer. Always be prepared to give an answer. To whom? To everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that you have, yet with gentleness and meekness. You can't go into somebody and say, hey, your way of thinking about the world is all wrong, man. You're just, you're messed up. You need to think about it this way. You're going to lose them, okay? We do it gently, okay? We try to say, you know, have you ever thought about the fact, and you share some interesting thing that you've learned about God and his role as creator, we know this one, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And in John 3, 17, he says, For God sent not his son to the world to condemn the world. We're not here to condemn anybody. But that the world through him might be saved. And we are ambassadors for Christ. We have the privilege of being able to help bring this message of salvation to other people. And we do it by making the Bible the foundation for our thinking in every area. And we start with that, and then we go forward. I told you I was talking about some resources. Has anybody familiar with this video, documentary, Is Genesis History? Raise your hand, please, if you have seen this. There's a few more here who have it. We're going to have to work on something like that, Pastor. Maybe we can come up with something. All right. Uh, I talked about the puzzle of ancient man. Uh, this book by Bruce Malone, who was my guest speaker at a Zosa meeting here back in January. It's called Brilliant, Made in the Image of God. Same idea. He talks about some of these things that ancient man has been able to accomplish. Uh, three great resources to go to. Websites, Answers in Genesis, Institute for Creation Research, and Creation Ministries International. If you have any other questions, we're going to do some question and answer now for a little while. And we'll just do questions that way. Okay. All right. That sounds great. So with that, I want to thank you all for coming. And we'll do the Q&A over there. All right. Do we have... Uh, if you'll, if, I'll offer a closing prayer, if that sounds reasonable. Let's bow our heads, please. Father in heaven, thank you so incredibly much for revealing yourself to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, who, in addition to being our Savior, is our Creator, for raising up uh, this, this generation of scientists who believe in you and who know how to do research and who know how to discover these truths about our true history and the evidence that supports your word as being true. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit that dwells within us and empowers us and enables us to to confidently know that your word is true and to stand by your word and to enable us to be ambassadors to witness for you to a perishing world. We thank you so much for this time that we've been able to spend here this evening. And we look forward to more throughout this weekend. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much, folks. Now, somebody who's going to say a word up here, right?